Hello and welcome to No Strings Attached. My name is Ken Skye and I'm honored to not only introduce to you our host, Dr. Mark Goulston, but also his first guest, Marshall Goldsmith. Now today is March 4th, 10 a.m. Pacific time, which means we're live on LinkedIn. So if you see this, please comment and let us know that you can hear us and see us. And if you have any questions. Now, I must say that not being in the executive coaching field as much as Dr. Mark, I didn't know much about Marshall Goldsmith, but I have been learning about him. And Dr. Mark shared with me that this show, No Strings Attached, was inspired by Marshall Goldsmith and his project called Knowledge Philanthropy, where Marshall is just sharing his best ideas with the world with no strings attached. Now, I haven't had a chance to ask Marshall yet, but I'm guessing he's doing so because he's grateful to the world and how life has turned out for him. And this is his way of giving back to the world. I know that this is certainly how Dr. Mark feels. So without any further ado, please welcome Dr. Mark Goulston. Boy, am I excited. I am thrilled to have Marshall Goldsmith on the show. Uh, uh, you know, anybody who knows Marshall, he puts a smile on your face. Uh, he, you feel enjoyed by Marshall and you enjoy him. And, and, and what I like most about, well, many things, but he has chutzpah. A lot of people in the coaching field just don't have chutzpah. And so he is a great role model for how to be bold. And as Ken said, this whole show, No Strings Attached, came from a conversation with Marshall. And Marshall said, you know, Mark, you know, we're not spring chickens. We got a lot of good ideas. We love ideas. You know, to sit on them and be worried someone's going to steal them from you. You know, he basically said, you know, Mark, if you give stuff away, no one can steal anything from you. You don't have to worry about it. And I thought, what a great idea. And so No Strings Attached is an oasis in the middle of LinkedIn for anybody who's having deal making and transaction fatigue and would like to visit a place where there's no strings attached, there's no uh, hitting on you. And we're just sharing things with you. And as Marshall said, let them monetize, let them build courses, who cares? If it helps their life, let them, let them just run with it. So Marshall, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. So much. Thank you so much for inviting me. Got an honor to join with you. This is a fun, fun project. So thank you so much. Well, you know, you're a fun, fun, fun guy. I mean, before we went on, he must have said, oh, we're having a little bit of tension. And he went into, there's no business like show business. I mean, you know, you are just, uh, you know, you're, you're just a ray of, uh, of fun in a world that really sorely needs it. So Marshall, um, and Marshall is filled with hidden in plain sight, I never would have thought of it, nuggets. Mm. And as soon as you hear them, you say that. I never would have thought of that. That would work. I think I can use that today. So Marshall, I, I was going to say, give us, you can give us any uh, thoughts you had or something, that, some idea that you're smitten with today that you want to just share with people uh, because they're, they're waiting to hear every word you say. Well, to me, we all have a different mission in life, which is fine. And my mission is to help as many people as I can make a positive difference in the limited time I have left to do it. I'm almost 72 years old and I'm not unrealistic. I'm not going to be here forever. So I'm just happy I've been able to do it as long as I can. And I want to give away as much as I can in as many ways as I can. And my real contribution is to help great people who help others. For example, I'm not an expert on the environment, yet I'm the coach of Mark Tursik, who led the Nature Conservancy 10 years. I'm not an expert on solving world hunger, but I coached Jim Kim, who saved probably 10, 20 million lives. 
and was president of World Bank and founded Partners in Health. You know, I'm not an expert on libraries, but I was a coach of the New York Public Library. And so, and, and the corporate CEOs I coach, they get better, they help people have a better life too. So for the listener, my mission life is pretty simple. It's help you have a better life, it's help you be the person that you wanna be, and then maybe help others be the people they wanna be. So that's, that's it. It's a pretty straightforward, very simple mission. And, you know, Mark, the, uh, when I coach my clients, I just say, like, Mark, my job is to help you have a little bit better life. And the people around you have a little better life. And I always ask him a question. Do you have any objections to that? Do you have any objections to that? So far, shockingly, and you've met some of the people I worked with who are among the most famous CEOs in the world. None of them have objected. None of them have ever said, yeah, that's a dumb idea. I, I don't like that one. No. They, nobody's ever objected. So it's a wonderful, wonderful mission. I love what you're doing. You're doing the same thing, basically giving back. Why not? Yeah, that if if you're watching and listening, that is typical Marshall. I mean, think of it. If you say to someone or you're coaching someone and you say, I'm here to help you get better in any way that you choose that's important to you. You got any objections with that? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I want to stay the same and continue to make my life and everyone else's life miserable. That, oh. that is wonderful. That is wonderful. Yeah, that's good. So, so, can, so can you share some of the other things? Because a lot, because one of the things that I've discovered and is that people don't necessarily do what's important to them. They do what they care enough about. It's important to me to eat well. I don't care enough about it to do a good job. So, so can, do you have any other tips about how do you get people to, or how do you cause them to care enough about taking steps to make their lives better? Well, I'm going to answer that in two dimensions. One dimension, I'll talk about the traditional coaching that I've done over the years. And then two is the, what I'm doing with the LPR and the daily questions. So first, my traditional model of coaching is uh, I work with phenomenally successful people, and my goal is to help them achieve a positive change in their behavior. And as you know, I have a very unique billing system. I don't get paid if they don't get better. And better is not judged by them or me. It's judged by everyone around them. So I'm pretty straightforward. So I would say, you know, Mark, I'm going to be, if you want to, working with you for the next year, year and a half, and here are the rules. Number one, you need to pick all the most important people in your life, you know, friends, family, coworkers, CEO, whoever it is. And then, then what's going to happen is they're all going to get confidential feedback. I get, I, they're going to give me confidential feedback about you. I go over this for you. You're going to pick things you want to work on. And you're going to then say, I feel good about this and I want to get better at that. And you're going to publicly disclose what you want to work on. You're going to apologize for all your previous sins. You're not going to get defensive. You're going to ask them for input. Whatever they say, you're going to shut up, listen, and say thank you. You're going to ask me for input. No matter what I say, you're going to shut up, listen, and say thank you. I don't care for arguing. And then I'm going to follow up with you on a regular basis, and you're going to get measured twice. And the CEO, if you're not the CEO, the CEO has to approve all this. And if you are the CEO, the board has to approve it. And they have to tell me that, hey, if you get better at this stuff, it's worth the money, assuming they do. Then I work with you for a year, year and a half, and you get better, and I get paid, and life is good. Now, then I would say, and you know, Mark, if there are any of these things you really don't want to do, that's fine. It's okay. I just won't work with you. I'm sure you're a fine person, but yet I'm not getting paid if you don't get better anyway, and I don't have to do this, so I won't work with you. So do you want to do this or not? Well, if he says no, what do I say? Thank you for sharing. Go by. Yeah, well, I, I've, I've learned a hard lesson, you see, in my role as a coach. Uh, my name is Marshall Goldsmith, not Jesus Christ. So I'm not really in the savior business here. I'm not trying to save anybody or, you know, if they don't care, if they don't care, I don't care. The client I coached that improved the most, I spent the least amount of time with. The client I spent the most amount of time with didn't improve at all and didn't get better. Humbly, I made a chart on one dimension, time spent with executive coach Marshall Goldsmith, the other dimension improvement. There was a negative correlation between spending time with me and improving. I thought this is troubling. So I go talk to my client who improved the most, my friend, Alan Mulally. Now you've met Alan, haven't you? Uh, I'd, I'd love to, but uh, you speak about him and the stories are amazing. 
He's an amazing guy. So he was a CEO of the year in the United States. He went to Ford. The stock was at one dollar. He left it was eighteen dollars and forty cents, and he had a ninety-seven percent approval rating as a CEO from every employee of a union company. Un unbelievable, oh, amazing man. So I said, Alan, of all people I've ever coached, I spent the least amount of time with you, and you improved the most. I showed Alan my chart. I said, Alan, the way this troubling chart looks, you never met me. You'd really been good. I said, what should I learn about coaching from you? And he said, number one, work with great people. You work with great people, you win. You work with the wrong people, you lose. And don't make it about yourself and your ego and how smart you think you are. Make it about how great they are. How great they are. And he said, as a CEO Ford, my job won that difference. I don't design the cars. I don't build the cars. I got to have great people. And every day I tell myself, leadership is not about me. It's about them. Well, that lesson changed my life. And one thing I'm really proud of, you know, 30 years ago, no CEO would admit to having a coach. They would have been ashamed and embarrassed to have a coach. They wouldn't stand up and say, I need to improve. Well, today, I'm, my book triggers 27 major CEOs endorse the book. I'm proud of that. 30 years ago, that would have never happened. Well, so... so you know, every time I hear you speak and you and you say, you know, it, it's a fairly simple kind of thing, you know, where, uh, you know, we're not going to uh, let the people we coach judge themselves. You know, really, the, the measure of it is the, how the people around them and who are important to them, how they think they're doing. And let's just check in and make sure that those people think that they're improving. What do you think is the resistance to that in the coaching profession? Because it is so simple, so clear and the clarity I'd say is brilliant, but it's not rocket science. Why do you think coaches get entangled with things? Is it they have to prove how smart they are? Or what's going on there? You know, a couple of variables. Well, there are all kinds of different types of coaching. So I don't want to, you know, offend any other coaches. They may be doing different things. That's fine. Or they may be doing life coaching, which is different. Uh, on the other hand, let's just look at the whole field of leadership development. They don't want to do this stuff. You think Harvard Business School, anybody that ever went to an executive education program as a leader ever was measured to getting better at anything is judged by anybody over any time frame. Of course not. They don't want to measure that. Why would they measure it? You measure it, you show that they didn't get better. If you don't measure it, say, did you like the class? Was the food tasty? Were your colleagues nice? Then they can win. It's a game they can win. So people like to play games they can win. The problem with this game is you may not win. You may not win this game and you don't get paid if you don't win. So it's not an easy game to play. It's very easy in theory. I mean, how many people come to you and say, look, I'll work with you for a year and a half and pay me nothing until the end. And if I get better and it's worth it, pay me. Not so many. That's not very normal. So it's it's quite different to do this. So, you know, I, I'd say it would be very hard for not many, most people to do this. And do you think part of it is because of the financial insecurity or oh, I've got to get paid and or, or is there self-doubt about that? Because it's so clear that, you know, uh, unless you improve, I don't get paid. And why would you pay me if you didn't improve anyway? And the way I'm going to find out if you improve is not from you, but it's the people around you. Are you motivating them? Are you demotivating them? Are you discouraging them? Are you inspiring? You know, uh, you know, with all due respect, it really doesn't matter what you say about yourself. Let's see what they say. And, and if that doesn't appeal to you, goodbye. I mean, it is so clear. Why do you think, do you think it is that people, you know, who are not in the position that you are, you know, because they're hungry. Oh, no, no, I, I can't pay for, do the pay for performance thing. Well, I mean, I started doing this when I was a kid and I talked to a CEO, but I also did leadership training too. So when you do other stuff, I had income, so I wasn't hungry. Uh, I, mean, I talked to a CEO and he said, this was before there was any field call coach. And he said, I get this kid working for us, young, smart, dedicated, hardworking, driven to achieve, arrogant jerk. He said, it would be worth a fortune to me if I could turn that guy around. So I said, I like fortune. Maybe I can help him. He said, I doubt it. And I said, well, I don't, maybe I could help him. Said, I don't think so. That came with my idea. I said, look, I'll work this guy for a year. If he gets better, you pay me. You don't get better, free. You know what he said? Sold. Sold. And that's how I got into coaching. And, you know, he got better, I got paid, and that's that was the beginning of my doing coaching. That was 30 years ago or so, or maybe more, a long, long time ago. And, you know, I said, I mean, I, I'll tell you what kind of inspired me. Back in Kentucky, I was brought up very poor. And uh, we had a leaking roof. 
And so my dad hired Dennis Mudd to fix the roof. Because you got to fix the roof or the house is just trashed, right? So dad has me help Dennis Mudd with the roof fixing. So Dennis is a nice guy trying to teach me how to do this. And he's very proud of what he does and very high integrity guy. And we got done. Dennis Mudd, my dad's name is Bill. So he looked at dad and he said, you know, Bill, I want you to inspect that roof. If that roof is of high quality, I want you to pay me. If that roof is not of high quality, it's all free. I was 14 years old. I looked at Dennis Mudd. You know what I said? I want to be him when I grow up. Now, Dennis Mudd was poor, but he wasn't cheap. And to be fair, Dennis Mudd had more integrity than I ever have. Why? If I don't get paid, life goes on. Dennis Mudd didn't have any money. He didn't get paid as hungry. Well, he had guts, though. And I always admired that, having that kind of courage just to step up and say, you know, hey, this roof's no good. Don't pay me. By the way, I told that story once um, in a magazine, and I got a note back from the guy that was a, he was the um, entrepreneur of the year in Kentucky. And as a young kid, he was poor. And Dennis Mudd, after he was a roofer, drove the school bus. And he used to talk to the kid after he dropped him off from school. And he said, the guy changed his life. So sometimes it's not always these big famous people that help us. Yeah, I, I have a favor to ask you because I have been quoting you and I'm. will you give me permission to use the quote that you never gave me? Sure. And, 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 the, and the quote was, I'd say, one of the things that I learned from Marshall uh, is, you know, it's good to focus on the future that nobody has screwed up yet. Because if you, <laughs> if you focus on something that's already happened, you know, uh, no matter how you try to put lipstick on a pig, they're going to get defensive. They're going to, you know, they're going to start blaming. But if you focus on the future that nobody has screwed up yet, you know, then you can be more, you know, focused. And and so and so that's why one of my favorite uh, lines that I got from you is going forward. Right. Uh, feed, you know, and one thing I teach is feed forward. Now, I've done this for 50, literally a year ago, November, I did this for 50,000 people in wow. St. Petersburg. And I've done it for six people. It's all my coaching is feed forward. In feed forward, you learned to ask for input, listen, and thank people. You don't promise to do everything. You promise to do what you can. You don't talk about the past. You talk about the future. People love feed forward. And what's nice about it, uh, Dr. Mark, as you said, people don't get defensive. Uh, I give you an idea for the future. Fine. You want to do it? Great. You don't want to do it. You're not going to do it. What's to argue with? I'm just trying to help you. I'm a Buddhist. Buddha said, only do what I teach if it works for you. Test it in your life. If it works for you, do it. If it doesn't work for you, it's okay. Just don't do it. Well, I like that. You ask for ideas. If they work for you, do it. If it doesn't work for you, it's okay. Yeah I, remember, it. yeah, I remember a story you shared with me. I hope this is right, but you, uh, or I heard you say it. You, you said there was one point when you asked your kids, you said, going forward, I want to be a better dad. Right. What do I need to do? And yeah. they said, and they said, don't travel so much. So what, what I did is my daughter's not well, sort of right. My daughter said, traveling is not what bothers me. It's the way you act when you come home. that bothers me. Ooh. Yeah. It's the way you act when you come home. She said, one time it was Saturday. I want to go to my friend's house and go to a party. And you tell me go to the party. I had to stay home and spend time with you. And then she said, you spent no time with me. That was not right. What could I say? Thank you. I said, I'm going to do better. I started keeping track of how many days I could spend four hours with my family. 1991, 92 days. 1992, 110. 1993, 131. 1994, 135. I made more money the year I spent 135 days, four hours with my family than you spent 20 days. Now it's January 1, 1995. They're both teenagers. I said, kids, look, 135 days, as far as with daddy, what goal this year? How about 150? <laughs> no, 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 no. Too much, too much. <laughs> yeah. Cut back, cut back of daddy. Yeah, if you want to be a better dad, back off. You know, uh, we're, we're, you know we, uh, we want to be yeah. our, own, uh, our own self. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, we, we told you we wanted more, not that much. <laughs> so, so any other little, uh, they're not little because they have a high payoff, but any other hidden in plain sight things that you've you know, been noticing? Uh, I just read a, a wonderful article that you're 
putting out now uh, and your uh, and you can tell people about where they can find that uh, but uh, you know what's the what's the top of your mind that's because you say you like ideas what's what's a recent idea that's captured your attention well I'm working with a group now the last few months called the LPR 50 it's a very interesting experience so every weekend I spend my friend and I Mark Thompson I spend six hours every weekend with 50 people and they're in six groups. They spend one hour each and we spend six hours and they rotate. And what we've intentionally chosen is an incredibly diverse group of highly successful people from different industries. So we have, and I can mention their names. We have uh, like Pau Gasol, the basketball player, uh, world champion with the Lakers. We have uh, Curtis Martin, National Football League Hall of Fame. We have Atelier uh, Villon, who played Aladdin on Broadway. We have, uh, the head of the Olympic Committee, the head of the New York Public Library, uh, CEO of Cardinal Health, CEO of Ancestry.com, just amazing, amazing people. And every week they rotate into different groups and every week they talk about their lives. And we practice something called the daily question process. So every day they have a little checklist and they evaluate how they did every day relative to things like, did I do my best to be happy, to find meaning, to build relationships, to set goals, to make progress, to be engaged, just basic questions. And then they write their own questions. And then every week, it's like a AA for successful people. They get up, you know, my name is, here's how I did. And it's a wonderful thing for a variety of reasons. One, people are lonely. And the old saying, it's lonely at the top. Oh, it's way lonelier at the top today. They can't say anything that goes out on social media without worrying about getting crucified. It's very lonely. They don't have anyone to talk to. And they don't have to put on a show. They actually get to be human beings for an hour. And, you know, we all screw up every week. And they get to be human and talk about their screw ups and life. And it's wonderful. And I'd say probably more than half of the issues are not at work. And more than half the issues are at home. And it's not they're bad people at all, yet at work everything is structured. Their time is structured. They're professional. And at home it's very easy to forget. It's very easy to forget and to forget where you are and what you're doing. And when you don't have that structure, it often falls apart too easily. So it's, it's been a wonderful, wonderful process. And uh, it's every weekend, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to 50 people talk about their lives and, and they love it because they're so different. So I'll give you a two case study. One is Dr. Jim Kim, you, you may have met him as president of World Bank and simultaneous MD and PhD with honors from Harvard, founder of Partners in Health. And there's Curtis Martin, the football player. So Curtis says, well, yeah, I'm kind of intimidated. You know, like Jim Kim, you're highly educated, so distinguished. I'm some football player. I said, Curtis, Jim Kim played football for his team in uh, Iowa where he was brought up. He was a starting quarterback. Curtis said, well, that's good. I said, yeah, but they didn't win any games. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Nothing but defeats. <laughs> he was terrible. I said, Curtis, Curtis, you think you want to be him? He wants to be you. And it's nice because you're in these people are so different that they don't it's not like a contest where one has to be better than the other one and probably two-thirds of people feel like what am i even doing here so let me ask you something um you can be seen by others as perfect you're not in the group every week yeah. So, so, so can you share things uh, that, well, you know, thank you for that, Mark, but uh, you know, uh, anybody who, uh, who thinks that is delusional. So what is stuff that you could get even better at? You could say, well, you know, something I'm working on is such and so. Well, what is something oh. that Marshall Goldsmith is working on? Oh, one thing I need to get better at daily is just keeping it present, maintaining presence and keeping in focus. Now, you might think I'm a Buddhist. I've read 400 books on Buddhist Buddhism or Buddhist philosophy. You think I'd be good at that? Not particularly. It's very hard to remain present. Now, 
I have someone call me on the phone every day just to listen to me read questions I wrote and provide answers I wrote. It's called the daily question process. Every day I have someone call me on the phone. You mentioned I'm perfect. Well, why do I have someone call me on the phone every day? By the way, for over 25 years, why have I had someone call me every day? My name is Marshall Goldsmith. All this stuff I teach, I'm too cowardly to do this stuff by myself. I'm too undisciplined to do this stuff by myself. I need help. And it's okay. I need help. Who are we kidding here? I got somebody call me on the damn phone every day. They listen to me read questions I wrote, provide answers I wrote every day. Why? I'm too cowardly and undisciplined to do it by myself. When I try to do it by myself, I don't do it. By the way, the daily question process, just make a list of questions, evaluate yourself every day, and you get a report card. Half the people start doing it, quit in two weeks. Why? It takes a lot of courage to look in the mirror. It takes a lot of humility, and it takes a lot of discipline. Now, the only thing I have is I have enough humility to admit I can't do it by myself. So I got one of three. Courage, nope. Don't have the courage. And discipline, way no. I definitely don't have the discipline. So if I don't have somebody call me every day, I'm no, I won't do it. Why? It's too hard. By the way, one thing I've learned is, you know, life is real easy to talk. And it's very difficult to live. And, you know, in my fine introduction here, I've won many awards and all that stuff. Well, you know, one thing wasn't mentioned in my introduction. I have an amazing gift of being able to screw something up every day. I'm just dazzled by my seemingly endless ability to screw something up every day. Now, how about you, Dr. Mark? Do you ever screw something up every day? Uh, I'd say multiple times a day. <laughs> I, I, I'm way ahead. I'm, I'm a precocious screwer upper. I do it many times. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to share. Can I share? Can I share something with you? Can I about being sure. present? So there's something that uh, that uh, I try to practice, and it's a work in progress. But when I get it right, I am a hundred percent present, and it's something that we call the Hoover technique. And okay. Hoover, and Hoover stands for heard out, understood, valued, added value. Okay. So, so what that means is at least once a day, I'll have a conversation and I'm going to say, you're going to be present. And so what I'm there to be is for them at the end of the conversation to feel I heard them out. I didn't interrupt them. I didn't Shanghai it. I understood them, which means I asked questions for them to go a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. I valued what they had to say because yeah. I actually saw the value. I saw the application. I'm having you on as the first guest because your value is immense. And I somehow added value to their value. And, and I rate myself on a scale of one to 10. Uh, and, and, and I find that when I, when I can do that, when someone else feels I've heard them out, understood them, valued them, and added value, you know, I'm just following an algorithm, but they experience me as present. Good. Crazy. Not rocket science. It's not, boy. It's not rocket science. You know, it's you know that, that's another thing. I because I've seen you. You know, when you when you're interviewing people, and and it is so non rocket science. And it's but it's so. Why do you think people don't see the stuff that is so obvious after you tell them? Well, the two issues. One is getting people to see something. Two, though, is getting people to do something. And you know, it's hard. It is very hard. Look, behavioral change is incredibly difficult. I mean, I'm not saying that I have someone call me every day to be cute or funny. It's true. It's hard. It is very, and it's not because we're mean or stupid or evil. These people like, these 50 people on the phone, how many expectations do they have in their lives? How many people are calling them up? How much stuff is going on? They're bombarded over and over and over and over with stuff, right? It's very hard to keep in focus, to keep clear. What am I doing? Where am I? Not because they're stupid or mean or evil. They're busy. They got a million things beating them over the head. And by the way, they're all good. Okay, let's see. Uh, uh, meditate every day. Be a vegan. Uh, go on a low-fat diet. Work out. Be nice, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, it's all good, right? Write books, make money. You know, it's all good. It's just 
unfortunately, there's only 24 hours in a day. And you're not going to do all that stuff. So just it's very hard to keep focused. And one thing is also something new I'm working on is empathy. Empathy is a great example of this. I used to think empathy was a good thing. But now I realize empathy is a lot more nuanced than that. It can be very good. It can be bad. So four types of empathy. Number one, empathy of understanding. I understand why you're doing what you're doing. I'm good at that one. That's my best strength. Could be good as a coach. It's helpful. Could be a parlor trick. I'm sure you've done this yourself. I have, where we just prove how smart we are and it's insightful. And, and by the way, sociopaths are good at the empathy of understanding. Yeah, that's, they're very good at it. Uh, propaganda people, excellent at the empathy of understanding. So it could be good, could be bad. The second type of empathy is empathy of feeling. I feel your pain, I feel your joy, could be good. Makes me more connected to you. On the other hand, I work in a children's hospital. I feel your pain, I got a terrible life. That's all I feel all day is pain. And I'm a Buddhist. You can't carry around everyone else's pain. You're just gonna live in pain. The next one is the empathy of caring. I care about you. Sounds good. You want people to care, to try. I went to a, a session with a hedge fund manager. It was fascinating because he was a hedge fund manager. This, I was shocked when I heard this. And this guy worth a billion dollars interviewing a guy with multiple billions. And he's a poor guy who says to the rich guy, you know, why don't you have your own fund? You could make a zillion dollars. Everyone would invest. You know what he said? When I was younger, I didn't care. I made billions for people and lost billions. I didn't care. I got older, I started caring. And I felt bad. I thought this is retirement funds. This is these people livelihood. I started caring. I became much less effective. That's why doctors can't operate on their family members. That's why in the hospitals, people burn out. You've got to learn when to care and when to let it go. And then finally, the empathy of doing, that's our need to help people. Good news is we want to help people. Bad news, we can create dependency. We can make people like children. So what empathy is right? Well, my friend Telly, the Broadway star, taught me the best lesson about that. He said, authentic empathy is you're being what you need to be for the person you're dealing with at that time. That's it. Authentic empathy is not, I'm a martyr, I'm a victim. I'm whining about something that happened last year. Authentic empathy is I'm being who I need to be with the person I'm with right now. And he's an actor. And, you know, he was on Broadway every night. And he said, every night I fell in love with the princess. And he's gay. And he said, I go home and there's my husband. Well, I didn't stay in love with the princess. But every night I had to change my emotions over and over again, night after night. And how he kept motivated, he said, when he was a little kid, he went to a Broadway play. And he was eight. And it was so positive and singing and dancing and music. And he said it was the best thing ever happened to him. And he said, every night he goes on stage, he thinks of that kid. This is for you. And it's hard after a thousand performances of the same show. Doesn't matter. Night after night after night. This is for you. So easy in theory, not so easy in practice. You know, something I'll share with you. I don't know if we've talked about this, but um, I, I have a recent book out called Why Cope When You Can Heal, and I introduced to the world something called surgical empathy, because I, I was a suicide uh, for 25 years, and you're right about feeling people's pain. That's why I'm retired. Yeah. But for 25 years, none of my suicidal patients killed themselves, and I was trying to figure out what happened. And here's what I discovered, is death is empathic to hopelessness that won't go away. Yeah. Death feels and offers to relieve that pain, so you attach to it when nothing else will. But what I realize is death feels your feelings and takes it away. So surgical empathy is causing people to feel felt by you, which is, which is more than understanding them. And when right. people feel felt by you, uh, especially when they're feeling, as you say, lonely or alone, when people feel felt, they will detach from what hasn't worked and they will attach to feeling felt and they start to cry with relief and they start to cry with the beginning of healing. So it's a, but it's a combination of those things, but, uh, but your warning I am taking, uh, I, I'm, uh, so now I, I won't work with people 
one-on-one. -on -one. I won't work with the suicidal individual, but I will speak to groups of parents and counselors about right. here is how to get through that to them. Uh, because when they feel felt by you versus, as you said, right. the empathy of understanding, they feel less alone in hell. And when they feel less alone in hell, they start to cry. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. So Marshall, you've given us the gift of more time than you, you planned on doing it. So uh, uh, anything you want to share with our viewers, listeners, uh, uh, I guess you, I would say you want to find out more about Marshall Goldsmith, just go to LinkedIn. I mean, you're all over yeah. the place. Well, on LinkedIn, I, I can't have any more what are called connections because they max out. On the other hand, and I hate the term followers, but I, I you can have all the followers you want. So if you do that, then you get stuff. Also, my website, www.marshallgoldsmith.com. I give everything away. Send me an email, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. Marshall has two L's. And the only thing is, if you send me an email, it just takes me a while to get back to you. So I can't promise I can get back immediately. I always get back to people, though. Sometimes it takes a while. So again, you know, and then all my stuff, by the way, you know, Dr. Mark, back to the model, I call it reverse franchising. Look, all my stuff, copy, share, download, duplicate, put your name on it. I don't care. Charge for it. Don't charge for it. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference. And, you know, anything you... Anything I can do to help you help other people so much the better. And, and again, my job, my mission is to help you, the listener, have just a little better life. So hopefully, hopefully a little something today, maybe help you have a little better life or some of the people around you have a little better life. You know, that is so Buddhist. I mean, you, 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 you know, Sky, Skywalker, you've done well. I mean, it's so, it's so, uh, because I, I think what Marshall's showing us is that when you, instead of holding on things, instead of being too possessive, when you give what you know to the world that will help the world, it really does come back. Plus it frees you from having to be worried about, you know, who's going to take it from me. I mean, you know, you know, just, just take it, run with it and make your life better. And if you're a reciprocator, you'll come back. Maybe you'll give me something. Maybe you won't. I don't care. Be a taker. All right. Yeah, that's right. By the way, I've got a charity called the, 100 Coaches Pay It Forward Institute. So what I tell people is, look, if you feel the need to give money, just donate money to the charity. That's fine. There and how, how much? Nothing is fine or anything you want to. I don't care. <laughs> the only other thing I do with my charity, though, is there is no acknowledgement of any donation. So if you want to donate stuff, you can, but there's not going to be a contest and all that nonsense. So, so just you can do anything you want to. It's just... You only do it because you want to do it. There's no acknowledgement for it. You know, that is so analogous to, you know, pay me if you get better. I mean, that is so Buddhist. Pay me if you get better. You want to donate and it comes from your heart. That's okay, but I'm not going to give you credit for it. You know, you know, if you if you give, it should be anonymous. And if you're in it for ego, then go donate somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you. And just... Thank you for being my friend, Marshall. Oh, Thanks thank you. Me. You're making a lot of lives better out there. So thank you. And you've got a great spirit toward life. Well, well so do you. And I look forward to our, our, our continuing journey together. So Ken, do you, do you want to take us home? And, uh, and thank you for watching this. And it'll be up there. And thank you. It has been a pleasure. I, I literally feel like I was a fly on the wall here. So... Thank you for sharing all, all the, the beautiful things. And if I may make a, a quick attempt at summarize the highlights for me. First, I don't have to be an expert to help somebody change the world. Thank you, Marshall. There's, that means there's hope for me. Two, don't talk about the past. Talk about the future. Yeah, Love it. It's so much in aligned with what I believe in as well. Being present, being focused. And uh, it's easy to talk. It's hard to walk. Yeah. And with that, I want to thank you as well for being part of um, our guest here today. And I will take us home. And I look forward to seeing you around soon again, hopefully. Thank you so much. Thank you.